These are summaries of the AQA P1 energy topic. Energy is the most fundamental idea in physics, and that's why AQA GCSE starts here. This is relevant for all other exam boards. Every single GCSE has a big topic on energy, and this is the same content regardless of which exam board you're on. This video is a summary of all the content, but if you haven't learned this yet, then you want to check out my in-depth videos for each of these topics. <laughs> This is a summary of GCSE Physics, Paper 1, Energy. Now, although this is structured using the AQA specification, this really applies to all GCSE Physics. Let's just start by a little bit of context, and where we start this whole GCSE from is the idea of energy. So this is the first topic in the AQA GCSE, Energy. Watt and Joule were two pretty important people, and they developed steam engines, and they, they worked out that you were transferring energy from a thermal store by doing mechanical work. So essentially they heated something up and then used it to do mechanical work. They compared the output of the stores by using the idea of a weight lifted multiplied by the height it was lifted through. And there's a great deal of discussion at the time about the idea of a heat engine and they realized that it was really impossible to recover that energy which was lost to the surroundings which was dissipated as heat. Now that word dissipated keeps coming back time and time again and it means that it's been spread out and become too small to use. Now though we have a real issue around fossil fuel reliance. We've got shortages of fossil fuels and also our use of them is leading to global warming. So it's a problem that actually physics can solve and we can solve our energy problems by maybe using less less energy, re reducing our demand, and you have a big part of that as well. There will be technological solutions as well to our energy problems, but one way to solve those problems is actually to reduce our demand, that reduce the amount of energy that we require. Part one then, energy changes in a system and the way that energy is stored before and after such changes. So firstly, let's define what a system means in this. It's an object or a group of objects, that's all. When a system changes, the energy is stored in different ways. And there are eight stores, there are eight ways to store energy. Chemical, thermal, kinetic, gravitational, elastic, nuclear, electrostatic, and magnetic. And you need to memorize them all. And you need to be able to recognize them as well. There are four ways that we can transfer energy between those stores. That's by mechanical work, so that's by physical force is electrical work and that's by current essentially moving charged particles and then there's heating by particles and heating by radiation essentially let's simplify this down to an analogy we've got the energy stored in one store and we transfer that into another store essentially whenever a system changes we are changing where the energy is stored it's the same energy we're just storing it in a different way now the most important point about this entire topic in energy is we don't have much of an idea of what energy is but we know that we can calculate it so for each of these eight stores we can calculate a size we can calculate a value for how much energy we have stored in that and that allows us to do calculations to make other things happen or to work out other important quantities. So you need to get really good at identifying those stores and transfers. And whenever you recognize it's a stores and transfers question, I suggest you use a simple sentence structure like this. The something store of the object decreases, the energy is transferred by, and then the something store of the object increases. So the first store is identify one of those eight starting stores and what is the store of, as in what object are we talking about? Then the energy transfer is one of the four energy transfer options that I've given you. And then the final store, whatever that type of store is of this, which object that is storing it. So here's a for example, for a petrol car, the chemical store of the fuel decreases. The energy is transferred by mechanical work the kinetic store of the car increases. For a falling ball, the gravitational store of the ball decreases. Energy is transferred by mechanical work. The kinetic store of the ball increases. So we, all we've done is identified the starting store, the final store, and the way in which the energy has been transferred between them. So here's some other common examples. So energy in an object moving upwards starts in the kinetic store. It's transferred mechanically to a gravitational store. An object hitting an obstacle, it starts with energy in the kinetic store. It's a mechanical energy transfer and it ends up heating the surroundings. So the thermal store in the end. An object being accelerated, we just, we don't have any detail of where the energy's come from. So we've got a mechanical transfer into a kinetic store. A vehicle slowing down would initially have all the energy in the kinetic store, then it's mechanically transferred by the brakes 
to the thermal store of the surroundings that is so boiling water in a kettle starts in an electrostatic store let's say that's called that the mains and then the energy is transferred by electrical working through the heating element to a thermal store of the water and that's really all there is to it this is an oversimplification but these are some really really straightforward marks to get as long as you've memorized your eight stores and your four transfers these are really straightforward marks to get as long as you've memorized your eight stores and your four transfers and you can use that simple sentence structure The most important thing about energy is that we can calculate it. So when we're talking about changes of where energy is stored, we need to know the equations which we can use to calculate it. So one pro tip that I have for you is to memorize the units and practice converting into SI units. But you need to be able to calculate values for these stores. This is the kinetic store. Kinetic energy is a half times the mass times the speed squared. So don't be confused by this squared at the end. You just need to be able to type that into the calculator with values instead of mass and speed and your calculator will do the thinking. That is one that you do need to memorize. Gravitational potential energy, again, is something you need to memorize. That's gravitational potential energy is mass times G, which is gravitational field strength, usually 10 newtons per kilogram, but they'll give you that that they expect you to use in any question times by the height. The elastic strain energy is a half times the spring constant, which is how stiff the spring is in newtons per meter, multiplied by the ex extension squared. That one is given to you on the formula sheet, so you don't need to memorize it. More about energy changes in systems now. Remember, we've just got this idea that one store empties and we've got an energy transfer and another store fills. A common energy store that you need to work with is a change in thermal energy. So this is thermal energy store. And that is given by mass, which is in kilograms, multiplied by specific heat capacity, which is in joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, multiplied by a temperature change. So that's what the little triangle means and the little theta, that means together temperature change. Change in thermal energy, delta E, change in temperature, delta theta. And that is given to you on a formula sheet. Now, memorize the definition of specific heat capacity is the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now actually notice that is exactly the same as the unit of specific heat capacity, joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So that is the same as energy per kilogram per degree Celsius, energy per mass per temperature change. So think of the unit as being equivalent to this definition or indeed equivalent to a rearranged form of that equation. Now remember that the mass means that something with a lower specific heat capacity could reach a higher temperature for the same amount of energy transferred to it. So something with a higher specific heat capacity would store more energy at the same temperature. In other words, if you have something like copper, which has a low specific heat capacity, if you put the same amount of energy in it as you did to water, the copper would reach a higher temperature. Or you could say that it takes a lot more energy to raise the temperature of water per kilogram per degree Celsius. There is a required practical that you need to do to measure the specific heat capacity. Memorize your methods for your required practicals. Firstly, you'd measure the mass of the block using a balance. Then you'd measure the starting temperature with a thermometer and you turn on a power pack and there's a diagram coming soon. You'd heat for a set time. Now I've given five minutes. Measure the final temperature with a thermometer. Notice how when I write a method here, I'm making sure I say what I'm measuring and what I'm measuring it with. Measure the final temperature with a thermometer. Then what you do with that data, calculate the temperature rise by subtracting the start temperature from the final temperature, so the difference in temperature. Then you calculate the energy transfer using this, the energy is power times time. So the power of the heater, most heaters that we use in the lab at least, is 50 watts. So five minutes, that's five times 60 seconds, 300 seconds, multiplied by 50 watts gives us whatever that power is. Calculate the specific heat capacity using the equation. And here's some example results for that, which you could work out the specific heat capacity for. Notice here that the water, the temperature rise is less than copper because water has a higher specific heat capacity. It's also really useful to memorize the evaluation points for all the required practicals that you need to do. So here's some. So for accuracy in this case, you're gonna make sure you explain how to use a thermometer. You keep the bulb, that's the bit with the alcohol in at the bottom, the black bit of the thermometer submerged whilst you read it. You read at right angles to the scale. So at eye level to the scale is another way to say that, to avoid what's called parallax error. You can use a longer time if you want more accurate timing. Precision is gonna be about repeated measurements in this case. If you repeat it, do you get little scatter from the mean? Do you get repeated values that fall close together? That's precision. 
A systematic error in this particular experiment is that energy is also transferred by heating to the surroundings. So the values of specific heat capacity we get from this practical is usually a bit too high. So one way you can get around that is to actually insulate the block. One way to improve this practical is to actually plot a graph. And what you do here is you take continuous readings for time and temperature. So rather than waiting for five minutes, take a reading every minute or so uh, of the temperature. And from there, work out the energy transferred at that point and the temperature rise. You can then plot a graph of energy, which is power, which is V times I times T, potential difference times current times time, to give you the energy on the y-axis. This is our change in energy here on the y-axis. and our temperature on the x-axis. Now the gradient of that will actually be mc, which will be the uh, mass multiplied by the specific heat capacity. So the gradient of this graph, you can see down here, y equals 1050x. So the gradient is all we're interested in, in this case. We can ignore the intercept. The gradient is 1050 and multiply that by four or divide it by 0.25 to give you c, which is the specific heat capacity. That is a really high order skill for GCSE, but they could ask you to do something like that. So power. Power is defined as the rate at which energy is transferred or the rate at which work is done. So there are two equations which mean the same thing. Power is energy transferred over time or power is work done over time. But importantly, I would think about it like this. The watt is a joule per second. Energy transferred in joules divided by time in seconds gives you power in watts. Both those equations state the definition of power which you should memorize is the rate of transfer of energy or the rate of work done. One watt is the same as one joule per second. Let's just think about applying that in, into a kind of described question. Something with a higher power does the same amount of work in less time. Something with a lower power maybe boils the same mass of water in more time. So power is the rate of energy transfer. How quickly do you do work? Now, energy transferred can mean any change in energy between any store in any way, but work done is specifically force multiplied by displacement. So just bear that in mind that these two mean the same thing, but there is a reason why we have a separate equation for power is work done over time. Now, don't get confused between the symbols for the quantities and their units. There's a W here for work done, and there's a W here for the watt, which is the unit of power. And please remember that capitals matter, watt, capital W, J for joules, capital J. Little s, but capital J, capital W. So conservation of energy is a huge idea and where that energy goes and this idea of dissipation, which was the trouble for people like Watt and Joule. The law of conservation of energy just states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, just transferred from store to store. So whatever the energy in the system we had at the start is the same as the total energy we have in that system at the end after a change. So there's two ways that energy can be used. It can be used usefully or it can be wasted. Usefully just refers to what we wanted a appliance to do. Remember though, there's no change to the overall energy, the total energy of the system. That's what the law of conservation of energy says. And in every transfer, there's some energy transferred as heating to the surroundings. We cannot avoid that. as usually a wasted form. So usually that's not what we want to happen. And we call this heating of the surroundings dissipation of energy. It's spreading out and becoming in too small quantities to be used again. In the idea of conservation of energy, we're just adding this idea that actually the decrease in one store equals the increase in another. It's still the same central idea. Energy in one store is being transferred into another store, but the decrease is equal to the increase. The decrease of one store is equal to the increase in the other stores. Because in reality, we don't just have energy going from one store and another. There is always going to be a little of energy transferred to heating of the surroundings. So for example, and let's say this is a car, the chemical store of the fuel is mechanically transferred into a useful kinetic store and the thermal store of the surroundings. So this plus this equals the start. So now the decrease of the starting store actually equals the increase of the final stores. It's just that it's going not into one store, but into two. And this pretty much always happens and we can't avoid it. We can, however, limit it. So here's some examples of energy being dissipated. When you pump air into a tire, the temperature of that air actually increases. When you do work against friction, whenever you rub two surfaces together, sanding, sawing, or hammering, then the temperature of that surrounding also increases. Water at a higher temperature than the surroundings, then that increases the temperature of those surroundings until the water reaches thermal equilibrium, the same temperature with the surroundings. 
that's quite obvious you'll know that that if you leave a hot drink out then it will eventually reach room temperature but you probably didn't recognize that was about the conservation of energy so there are ways to limit the rate at which heat is dissipated energy will be dissipated at a lower rate if a machine is lubricated that means using oil or even sometimes graphite or just water something to make friction a little bit less between the parts of the machine or energy will be dissipated at a lower rate if a thermal store is insulated so if you use an insulated mug your tea will cool at a lower rate and the energy will be transferred less rapidly at a lower rate to the surroundings now just one more idea well whilst we're talking about dissipation of heat we're talking about conductivity and conduction so a material with a high thermal conductivity transfers energy by conduction more rapidly so there is a demonstration that normally is shown rather than by holding onto rods rather than by something like a pin then we can demonstrate that one metal actually transfers heat at a higher rate than another metal or metals let's say transfer heat at a higher rate than wood and that means they have a higher thermal conductivity. Now in GCSE, I don't want to read that this thing is a conductor and this thing is an insulator. What I want to read is this thing has a higher conductivity than this one does. And that is just acknowledging the fact that nothing is completely one or the other. There isn't a set of perfect conductors and perfect insulators, but there's this scale of conduction or insulation, depending on how high the conductivity is. There's a required practical that only triple physics students have to do about thermal insulation. And basically you have to investigate one of the four factors which affect the rate of heat transfer. You're just allowing hot water to cool. You're measuring the temperature of the water with a thermometer at set time intervals. Remember what we're measuring and what we're measuring it with. We measure the time with the stopwatch. Then we plot a graph of temperature against time and we call these cooling curves. So temperature change against time, we call this a cooling curve or a heating curve, it could be as well, if it were working in the opposite direction. The steeper the gradient, the higher the rate of heat transfer. So the four factors which affect the rate of heat transfer, memorize them, are thickness, layers, conductivity, and color or luster. That's how, what, how dark it is or how shiny it is. In this practical, there's a risk of a scold when using hot water. Scolds are much worse than burns. If you were to have a scold, then you were to wash that under the cold tap immediately. And scolds are particularly bad because of the high specific heat capacity of water. So this is an example of where you may have to assess the risk in an exam. And you have to actually maybe give a safety precaution that somebody would do. If there was to be a scold, then we would wash that under cold water. You could get around that risk by not starting with scalding hot water, by actually starting from a temperature around 60 degrees, which is unlikely to cause serious skin damage. When we're doing this practical, it's very difficult to just change one of these materials. So my pro tip here is you have to think about a way that you can just change the thickness, or just change the number of layers, or just change the conductivity, or just change the color and luster. So if we use a different material, so we have a different conductivity, it tends to have a different color. So how would you get around that? If we were to use a different material, then one material may come in different thicknesses. If we were to use different layers, we're also increasing the thickness of our insulation as well. So it's very difficult. So for example, one way that they thought about this to keep the thickness the same whilst changing materials is to have actually two beakers, one small and one large, and stuff the space between the two beakers with that material so that the thickness remains the same and we've still got one layer and well, they've still got the same color because it's the glass outer color potentially. We've gone as far as we can to try and control the other three of these and when we just change one variable these are those cooling curves that we're talking about we have time measured in minutes it's enough to take readings every one or two minutes for this practical and um, they all limit the heat transfer by particles and we can then analyze which one had the highest rate of cooling so the bottom line has done the worst job of being an insulator it's had the highest rate of cooling Notice the graph does not start at zero because it's never going to actually reach zero degrees Celsius if we leave some water in a room. It's pointless us showing that. We just have lots of blank space on the graph. So start your graphs from somewhere sensible. It doesn't always have to show zero on the axes. This one, for example, the top might be have been two layers. The second one might have been one layer and the third one might have been no insulation at all. 
Now, when we're talking about analyzing that and explaining why it is that the different layers cause different rates of cooling or any of those factors have different rates of cooling, then we can talk about heat transfer by either particles or by radiation. So thickness, conductivity and layers, they all limit heat transfer by particles. That's by particles knocking into each other and therefore transferring the heat energy. Color or luster, they limit heat transfer by radiation. So there's actually a different heat transfer. That radiation is infrared. And remember, dark matte materials, they emit more infrared. They emit infrared at a higher rate, I should say. Efficiency is just defined as the ratio of useful energy or power transferred to total energy or power transferred. So what percentage of energy that we supply to something is transferred usefully? It can be expressed as a decimal or as a percentage. Here is one way of writing it and here is another. They are both the same equation essentially, but one is talking about useful output energy and the other is talking about useful power output. So they could give you this in either. They could give you a useful energy and a total energy or a useful power and a total power. Really taking the principle that if we want to increase the efficiency, what we need to do is reduce the waste, reduce the unwanted energy transfers. It takes practice to identify the useful and total energies in a question. Sometimes they might even try and trip you up a little bit by giving you the wasted energy and the total energy. So you'd first need to work out the useful value before you worked out efficiency. They also sometimes might give you the data on a diagram. And it's really important, this is something that they teach you in maths, you need to be good at working between fractions, decimals and percentages. Part 1.3 of energy goes on to talk about national and global energy resources and how we use them and why we make the choices that we make with our use of energy resources. Essentially, the energy resources we use to generate electricity on Earth are fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas. That's the most traditional way. We still use a lot of that. Nuclear fuels, biofuels, wind, hydroelectricity, geothermal, tidal and wave. Now you don't need to describe exactly how each type of electricity generation works. We used to in the old GCC, and so a lot of teachers still teach that, and it might be interesting to know how a power plant works, but actually we don't need to describe that in these new GCSEs. What we need to be able to do is to be able to compare them and give reasons why we would use one over another. We need to be able to evaluate the energy resources. When I teach this topic, I actually call it evaluating energy resources. And we might choose one for one reason and another for another reason in a different context. And we'll talk about context in a second. Define what a renewable energy resource is. That's a resource which comes back as quickly as we can use it. A non-renewable then is the opposite of that. Fossil fuels and nuclear fuels are examples of non-renewable resources. They're finite. They will run out at the current rate of consumption. That's the key point there. It's not as simply as a renewable energy resource will never run out. That's not quite correct. A renewable energy resource comes back as quickly as we can use them. This topic is not just about the way we generate electricity. We also use some of these resources for transport and for heating. Some resources are more reliable than others. In most countries, we're currently unable to rely solely on renewable energy, energy resources. For this reason, we have to have what we call an energy mix. So we need to move to a low carbon energy mix to avoid permanent environmental damage to our planet. Now you need to have a detailed understanding of the advantages, disadvantages and the environmental impact of each energy resources and you need to be prepared to apply them to a context in a question. An advantage in one context might be a disadvantage in another context and that's really why this topic gets a little bit tricky. You also need to be able to take values from graphs and charts and be able to take values and make conclusions with them. So these three graphs actually show different things. It's very important the first thing you do is always analyze exactly what the graph is showing. So compare the two axes together. This shows energy in thousands of terawatt hours per year across the whole world and it compares these different resources. It starts from 1965 to almost 2020. There is a slight difference between this graph and this second graph here which is actually adding the values together to give you the value on the y-axis. So there's a kind of cumulative energy use here and this is only comparing those three different sources renewable, nuclears and fossils. So you can still see around the world and this is where the title is useful around the world we are still using majority fossil fuels 
There's this really interesting dip here, whereby we used a little bit less between the years of about 2006 and 2009. That may have been because of the economic recession, but they will give you some clues as to what reasons it might be if they ask if they're interested in some of these little trends here. If they ask you to suggest reasons, then the answer to that might be as simple as well: people are using less electricity, or because people were buying less, the demand was lower. You don't need to go into the detail, well, maybe there was a global recession at that point. You need to just have that idea that, you just need to have that simple idea that there was actually less demand for electricity or energy during those years around the world. Here though, this pie chart is just showing the UK's electrical energy mix. So it's not all of energy, it's just energy used to generate electricity. And you can see here we have much larger slice still fossil fuels then nuclear and then some renewables as well and also this slice that we actually import from other countries so get this idea that what you need to be able to do with these is just to spot trends maybe compare changes or maybe overall demand between different sources this is a kind of discursive likely to be a four mark or a six mark written answer where you have to take data out of these charts and use them to make comparisons normally and make conclusions now really take this in that you need to avoid non-scientific language about energy resources. Don't say green energy, for example. Don't say pollutes. Be really specific. Use exacting language. Use exact language like does not release greenhouse gases, is carbon neutral, does not release acidic pollutants. Also be specific about the costs that you discuss. Don't just say nuclear costs more. You will not get a mark for that. Nuclear power stations are expensive to build or maintain. They have high decommissioning costs. That's the type of language you need to get into your answer here. To continue the example of nuclear, nuclear is actually less expensive per megawatt power output than a lot of other options, which is one of the advantages of it, in fact. So just to say nuclear costs a lot doesn't give as much detail. Be really specific about the advantages and disadvantages that you give.